This is the Zapata brand. Now your host, George Zapata. Welcome to the Zapata brand podcast. This one's a unique one to say the least. It is going to be something that is local and something that would probably interest you all uh, in the area of Berwick. Right now I have in the backstage is the candidates, well, most of the candidates for the 2023-2024 Berwick School Board uh, seats. I'm going to put them up on the board now, and then we'll go right around the horn, if they could, starting with Mark over at the top left, to introduce themselves and then give you an idea of who they are. Mark, you could start there. Hey, everybody. I'm Mark Nespoli. I'm a Berwick native, small business owner, and realtor in the area running for school board. Clint? Hi, I'm Clint Lanning. Um, live up in Hobby. Got three small boys that are two school age, one's coming. So running for school board. Okay. Leah. I'm Leah Zwolinski and I am a mother, a wife. I'm a biologist um, and I'm a school board candidate. Okay. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Hickson. I'm semi-retired. I also am a physician assistant in town. I've lived in the Berwick area and grew up here and came through all the school districts along with my children. Jen, you're up. Hi, I'm Jen Moyer. Um, I live in Hollenbeck Township. I have two little boys in elementary school, and this is why I'm interested in running for school board. Um, I'm very interested in making uh, Berwick uh, a lot better as far as education. Okay. And John? Hi, John Eisenhower. Um, small business owner in the area. I've been in Berwick my whole life. Grew up here, raised here. Uh, nuclear plant operator. Uh, two boys and a girl, both in school. Um, this is part of why I want to run for school board. Okay, good. All right, so now that we got all the players in the game, real quickly, um, the school board has been a very hot topic lately. Um, there's a lot that's going on in the area uh, between the Nescapec school, between the uh, pending union, uh, I wouldn't say strike, I would hope not to say strike, I would say uh, negotiations for the uh, upcoming contract. What I, the first question that I want to, that I want to put out there, and we'll get to we'll get to the the first question really that was the hot topic, was the, the Nescapec school. Right now, it was voted five four to close the Nescapec school. If you as a candidate get in, what what can we expect from your point of view, Mark? If you could, are you at? This is the question. I'm asking to anybody, Mark. If you start it, you can go because you're going left. We're going to go left to right and just. You guys can jump in. What you okay. let me ask, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. You guys get on the board. Where what is your point of view as to where where you stand with the with the Nescapec school? There is a divide of it should be open. There's a divide of it should be closed. Either way, it's going to cost the taxpayers money. Either way you look at it. Either way you cut it. The question is, where do you stand on each one? And you guys can answer and jump in. You know, I, I'm I'm looking at Mark. You you unmuted yourself first. Jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think we have to determine what the true cost of keeping Nescapec open versus closed is. And I think that answer is going to be different today than it was six months ago when they voted to close it. And I think it's probably going to be different again when the new board comes into, into play. Um, so you have to go back to the two most important questions are what's best for the kids, what's fiscally responsible for the taxpayer. For okay. me personally it's not so much about Nescapec as much as it is fifth grade at the middle school and class size. If we can bring class sizes down and get fifth grade back into the elementary schools without keeping Nescapec open, I'm all for that. I need to see that plan and I want to see it put into action with a five to 10 year um, strategic plan in place. Okay. I mean, is anyone else is similar Does anyone else a similar point of view as Mark? I think, I mean, for the most part, we've all discussed up until this point how a lot of our main goals would be bringing fifth grade back and creating mm -hmm. smaller class sizes for the entire district. And I think the most financially responsible way to do that is to use the real estate that we currently have to spread our students out and to bring fifth grade back and to not, you know, when we're in this financial position where we don't have extra money to be spending and we're still in debt from building West Berwick. I think it's important to use what we have and um, create smaller class sizes for the entire entire district with mm -hmm. Nescapec remaining open. 
Um, so you're you're saying you want Nescapec open? That's your your position. I at this time feel it's the only way to bring fifth grade back and create smaller class sizes for Salem, West Berwick, and Nescapec. Okay. Don't the only other way I see doing things would be to create additions onto current schools, and that's that's going to cost the entire community a lot of money. Okay, uh, Nancy, I see you unmuted. Uh, what, what's your position? I agree. I think we need to look at a lot of options, and again, the financial has to come into it. But I think the bringing the fifth grade back and also the class size is something I would like to look into, and I don't think it was done as well as it should be. There was not a lot of planning and only certain things. But could we possibly end up like a lot of other school districts? And I, this is an outside the box on top of bringing fifth grade down. Would it be worth putting a primary intermediate type school? you know schools down there where we have all the kindergartens in one building first grade and so forth because that way we could really keep the class sizes down because we could spread out the kids over seven eight classes at a time i'm not saying that's it i don't think any of that has been looked at and that's what i think needs to be done we need to sit down as a group and in our own area here where we have six of us right here talking now we can come up with a bunch of ideas and look through it and see which ones turn out to be financially mm -hmm. the best using like leah said all the real estate and square footage that we have in this district instead of just cutting it down and hopefully then possibly ending up with different class sizes and demographics everywhere okay i'm gonna go with jen right now i see her unmuting go ahead jen um, I have to agree with Leah. Um, I've talked to a lot of people and I feel the only way to bring fifth grade back is to keep the real estate we have, keep, um, we don't want to keep raising taxes if we don't have to. And I think if we have to keep um, building additions onto buildings, we're going to keep raising taxes. Um, we have schools that need repairs, but they're definitely fixable. And I think the best way to do that is just to keep the school we have um maybe if we have to redraw the line so we can get maybe some of the berwick kids over to nescapec to get the classes smaller in west berwick um that's definitely um something we need to do because i think that will help with um, increasing the grades too because you have the larger class sizes the kids that need more attention not that the teachers are doing it on purpose but they may be missing something where that child may need more attention if you have smaller class sizes those kids will be noticed that need more attention So. Um, I think it would be better just to keep all three schools and um, come up with other plans besides just closing a school and trying to add on. And I definitely would love to bring fifth grade back to the elementary school. I have not talked to any parent, teacher, or, or anyone in the community that thinks that fifth grade should be in the um, middle school. And I also think that if we move the fifth grade back, maybe only having sixth, seventh, and eighth in the middle school, some of the discipline and things like that will be could be easily addressed because they'll be able to see the where the problem kids are and they'll get, they can get more attention on the issues that they do have in the middle school. And I think that would stop some of the issues there. Okay. Now, Clint, I'm going to jump to you quick. Uh, with that, what your what your what your stance there is? If you unmute, you got to unmute yourself. Yep. There you go. Yep. Um, may not sound like an echo, but I kind of think we're mostly on the same page here. <laughs> we've looked at the numbers. We've all watched this, and everybody wants smaller class sizes. That's what's best for the kids. And reducing the amount of space we have is not. That's going to increase our class sizes across the whole district. And that's going to hurt everybody, not just one elementary school. So I think we need the room. We need to redistribute what school the kids go to possibly and move some kids around. Not that anybody ever wants to hear they're going to change their school, but discuss how that could look and how it could function. And that may give us the room to move fifth grade down, which everyone wants. And right now they're looking at, they're planning to close a building that's in relatively good shape structure wise. And we have another building Salem that needs a lot of repairs right now. We need to focus on getting that building back up to where it should be rather than closing one. If we close one and overfill 
that school, how can we possibly do the repairs we need to it and get it back to where it needs to be? <clears throat> and the numbers have showed from their own contractors and engineers that it's a more expensive option to try to add on to that school than keep what we have. So it's be a better deal for all the taxpayers to keep all three open and readjust how we utilize them. Okay. Now, John, you're last there. If you can give me your idea there, if you want to unmute yourself first, uh, to unmute, there you go. There you go. Good. Well, I don't want to sit here and the, revisit everything that's already been said. I agree with everything that every candidate has already put up, but I want to look at it from a common sense point of view. When it comes to Nescapec, my my thought <clears throat> is to keep it open for now because of the lack of planning that has been put into it, the lack of foresight that we have for a plan. I've been to the last board meeting, which was last night, not one word about how we're going to implement students over. Have the classrooms been uh, adjusted to fit this the extra um, students coming over. Nobody wants to talk about that at all. None of that has been brought up. So every time I look at it, I can't, I can't go into this thinking that a good plan has been put in place. Not at all. So I want to put the brakes on it just from there because it's going to be a, a major debacle. The, who we have running the school district right now, I just, I, I don't have any faith in the plan that, that, or the lack thereof that has been put forward toward this. <clears throat> Another thing about the common sense aspect of it, like Clint had uh, alluded to earlier, we have a building that was built in the 20s. I talked to the maintenance guys that look at that building, and they all told me that it's not like it's far worse than any of the other buildings. So you have to look at what kind of mortgage that we have on Nescapec, which is zero, because it's been bought and paid for a long time ago. We do not have the money to build on to any school. And if we did, everyone knows that if we build on to another school, we're going to have to borrow money. So right there, that aspect of it tells you we have a building that has no mortgage, and then we want to move to a building that we're going to have to borrow money to do something to. I think the best plan of attack right now is to take a look at Nescapec, get the kids back there. And if a long-term goal is to close Nescapec and consolidate them into one school, we have to come up with a better plan of action and start setting money aside for that now rather than have to borrow money in the future. Okay. And I see, I see where you guys all are. That is a, um, you seem to be all, all on the same page, right? Now, I, I, I think there's a little more nuance to it. I think we kind of simplified here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the numbers, like I said, are going to change. They're going to be different. We're uh, October. We're not going to be on and none of us will be on until at least January. The numbers are going to look different then. Okay. Um, the, I'd, I'd have to see all the options to see what's going to be best for all parties before I made my decision. Okay. Now here, here's, here's where I'm going to be on the business side, of this whole thing. Obviously I'm just a dumb bagel guy. That's all I am, but I'm going to do it from the business perspective. If I'm looking at it and saying, okay, we are going to now have to put money into now, uh, full disclosure years ago when this happened, I knew we were going to be at this point. I knew. Okay. And I've said, I, and not not that I have a, a dog in the fight. I'm just saying I knew we were going to be here. Nothing has happened, but I knew th that this was going to come up where we weren't raising taxes. At some point, your taxes have to go up. In a business, you have to raise your prices or you're out of business. That's just the way it is. Okay. So look at this in a, in a business perspective. Now you're in this dilemma where you have this property over here that's paid for. You have a new school that was built. You have other students that are coming in, but here's the caveat that I think we're not including in this, which brings me to my next question. Teachers are leaving. You have an impending union contract coming up. Can you guys negotiate with the union to make sure everyone sort of has an idea of where they're going to be in pay wise, because you're getting from the top and you're getting from the bottom. The middle people are the ones that are struggling because of what, what I hear. They're saying, okay, when you just come in to come in making your thirty-five thousand or whatever they make to start, and they're step one, they don't have any kids. They probably live with their parents still, maybe, maybe boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. It's that in between where inflation has eaten up just about most of their paychecks. God forbid you have a kid that's got to do daycare at three hundred dollars a week. You can't. It's it's un. It's not sustainable. Okay, so you have an impending 
shortage of teachers. You're looking to take students into an area. Now you're going to need more teachers. Okay. So I don't know how you want to go, you know, around the horn. If you guys, or whoever wants to unmute, I can put you on. Uh, if anyone wants to jump at it first, Mark, you want to jump at it? Go ahead. Sure. The, the question is, how do we attract and keep teachers? Yes. Because because now because um, now because you're saying you want to do do all this re uh, moving people everywhere, but you got to do something with with the figuring out what you can do with teachers. Yeah, I, I think that the the question about Nescapec is more of a microcosm of what's happened at the school district over the last twenty years. As you said, inflation's up; it's up forty percent in that time period. We didn't raise taxes for like twelve to fifteen years. We neglected building after building, and we made poor business decisions like moving fifth grade into the middle school. When these things keep on happening over and over and over again, culture takes a big hit. Leadership has to do things that they that may not be in the best interest of anybody. Um, and I think that's how we got here. And I think we need to make some drastic changes and look at the, the structure of the district, look at the contracts, see what we can do to entice educators to, to come here and stay here. Um, I've owned my own business for 20 years. And I can tell you that Compensation is probably the number one thing, obviously. However, the other things you do for your employees, the give and take, being open to conversation, um, these things are all equally important in the, in the grand scheme of things. So I think we need to have those conversations with educators to see what it is exactly they want beyond compensation to see how we can make that happen for them. Okay. And is there, if someone want to jump in, jump in, I'll, I'll put you on. Okay. Go ahead, Nance. I, I, you know, they always say we can't get the new people. We do have to turn around and raise the beginning salary. Yeah, they're living with their parents and all, but to get them here into this district, we need to take that first step and raise it. But we can turn around and possibly look at some of their benefits and things. They probably are not going to have as high a health care, things like that. So we can look at that compensation that maybe we can get some money back. And then there was certain things that have come up that I've heard where, you know, okay, the high salaries are too high here, you know, uh, we can't afford it, things like that, that I've heard from a bunch. But it isn't only just looking at a true money. You have to sit down with your employees and say, and be honest with them and say, here's where we're at. Maybe we can't financially raise that top one, but you can, like Mark had said, and what I have turned around is, Find out what that teacher needs. Maybe they want an extra planning period. Maybe they want less duties on a day. And if they have been in this district, not in teaching, but in the Berwick district for five years, we can give them this benefit. When they hit 10 years, we can then turn around and give them some other benefit. And again, pay for more of their um, you know, health care, things like that, after they hit a certain raise and turn that around. But we do need to bring the group, the bottom one up, the salary up there to get the newer teachers. And the second thing that is not going on that we need to do is we're we got to keep the teachers that come in and go through the interview. And maybe we're not hiring them this time, but we should be calling those teachers and saying to them, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you this position you interviewed. But boy, I really need you to stay here and be a sub and take and try and get those because a lot of them come in, they interview, they get the call that we're not hiring them in this district and nothing else is said to them. So they go somewhere else to be a sub. And those are the things we need. But the bigger thing is sitting down with the teachers. They're professionals. They know what's going on, but them covering as many people as they do when they, a call off and us not having subs, we're burning our teachers out and they're not going to be able to handle it. And those are the things that I feel we really need to try and do, sit down and have a true conversation with our, as Mark put them, employees as they are and try to do what we can. It's called a compromise. And I think any professional is going to want to compromise with us. Jen, Jen you're up. Um, I feel there's a huge lack of communication between the teachers and the administration. And I've spoken to teachers before, and I 
think they feel that they're not heard. And when they do want to address um, situations, um, they don't get results. So I think that's a big issue. I'd also um, like to know if they do exit interviews when these teachers are leaving the district to find out why they're leaving the district. Um, is it just more money or are there other reasons why they're leaving the district? Because um, I've heard that there's other reasons, but um, I think exit interviews are very important because you can see where your your shortfalls are and then you could try to fix them to get the other teachers to stay or to hire new teachers. Okay. Leah, you're up next. Go ahead. I think there are two main things that need to be addressed. I mean, the first is the contract and that's, it's a daunting task, really. I mean, it's, it's very complex. We currently have a lot of steps. Um, maybe something to look for in the future would be to reduce the number of steps we have and to increase the people on the bottom so that they start out a little bit higher. Um, but Berwick, you know, currently might have an issue attracting teachers, but that's where the second issue of culture comes in. Berwick has historically been a lower paying school district, but we have attracted teachers and really great teachers in the past. And it's, you know, a lot of it is about money for people. And that makes sense. People have families they need to support. And um, you can't blame them for wanting to earn a higher rate for what they're doing. Um, but when you provide a culture and an, an environment where people want to come and they can teach um, and feel like they're making a difference and feel like they're being heard, I think that's incredibly important to people. And I think it's a really great way to keep people. And I think we need to work on the culture that we're providing for people um, and how they're listened to. And um, I think, you know, contracts and culture are the main are the main topics when it comes to teachers and keeping them. And and there's a lot of work to be done. There are a lot of discussions to be had, but it's important and it's it's important work that needs to be sorted out. Okay, good. John, you're up, buddy. Uh, just unmute yourself, John. Unmute. Okay, so go. when it comes to the contract, let's talk about that. I don't want to promise anybody anything that I don't know that what we have or what we don't have. We need to sit down with the budget and see what we have. Obviously, George, when it comes to compensation for our teachers, you want to give them the most that you can and be fair to the taxpayer at the same time. The biggest issue that we have is, one, Pennsylvania has issued 70% less teaching certificates now than they have 10 years ago. There's just a lack of teachers to begin with. So throwing money at it, yeah, that might entice people to come here, but teachers are just like anyone else. They talk. The teachers that we have now are going to tell pr prospecting teachers what it's like here. So when you tell a teacher that might come into our district that you're going to have a kindergarten class with 22 to 23 kids and you're going to start out making the same kind of money that you do at Burger King or Walmart, and not have to put up with that stuff at Burger King or Walmart, what do you think they're gonna do? So we have a lot of issues here. Would I love to give teachers that are coming in more of a salary? Yes, but at the same time, I'm not gonna promise them something that I don't know if we even have yet. We have to look at that. We have to look at raising taxes. We have to see what's fair to the taxpayer. At the same time, when it comes to like inflation, what we had hinted on, you're asking taxpayers to go ahead and give teachers a bigger raise because inflation has eaten up their paycheck, but they're all in the same boat too. Like where I work, inflation has, you know, even though we make decent money, inflation has affected everybody. So you have to be real careful when it comes to promising people something to entice them here. You have to look at the big picture. What do we have? What can we offer? And what is the biggest reason why they don't want to come here in the first place? And I could tell you, if you told me that I had to watch 22 kindergarten children in one classroom that would bother me. I'd much rather be around 15 to 16, something like that. If they can find a district that has better numbers, they might be going there. That could be a big part of our problem too. We have to assess the situation before we make a lot of promises is my, I think the main point I'm trying to make here. Okay. Clint, you're up, buddy. Okay. Um, contract is every school district struggles with the contract. That's always a tough back and forth to figure out where you can be and based on what they want. And we have limited money in our district as we know. So we got to really look at where we're at, look at where our pays are to be competitive with other districts and what we can do 
like was said, looking at the low and middle, not necessarily the top, may be something there, but a lot of it beyond pay. I know a lot of people, even in other industries, your work environment sometimes plays in more than your pay. I've had friends that have changed jobs and actually took a lesser pay because their environment was better. And that's something we definitely need to look at right now. We said a little bit, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of good talk between teachers, administrators, the board. And I think we need to change that where we figure out what the teachers need, what would keep them there, what makes them happier working in our district so that we can retain them and get new ones there. We also need to look, We, it seems we've had a high turnover of administrators. We just lost one again this last board meeting. If there's, uns, if the district seems unstable, your work environment's unstable, you're gonna have a hard time picking up new teachers. So I think we also need to look at why are we changing administrators so often? Every time we change administrators, we're changing how everything gets operated for the teachers. So there, yeah. so I think that's something also we need to look at, and it may affect our retention rates on our teachers. All right. Now, now I will say that um, mostly the there the teachers here are that are here, even in the administration, have been here a long time. You know, they've come through the system that they've gone up. But first, I'd like to say I wanted to thank you guys for all coming. To be honest with you, um, because I didn't think I'd be able to get this together. And uh, we all, I had all but two come on, which is good. Uh, but in this point, the next question is going to, I'm going to touch on, it's going to be a little bit of controversial. So I just want to make sure you guys are, are clear with that. Um, the current leadership here, um, do we, are, are we confident that we're moving in the right direction? Or are we kind of like... Uh, don't know what we're doing at this point. And I only say that because of um, what I hear on my end. I am, again, just a dumb bagel guy just trying to make a living. And uh, everybody knows everyone comes in, they kind of, there's a lot of grievances <laughs> that I hear during the day. Um, but my point is, you guys are coming in, whether you guys are, um, and wait, wait, did, we, did we lose Jen? Nope, there we go. Let me add her to the stage. There you go. Um, what what my question is being is because now where you guys are coming in and like uh, Mark said that things have been the same and stagnant for about 12 to 15 years. So you're almost working on two decades right around there where it's kind of been the same. Nothing's really changed. Tax is really the, what they are. Now we're at a time where it's after an event that was a hundred year situation pandemic. That money's all gone. That's gone. The, the stuff that they gave out, that's gone. So now we're starting from ground zero behind the eight ball a little bit because no one plans for something like that. We need leadership in place. Are you guys willing to go to the edge to push the envelope as to where whether we can we have to drag like Mark said drastically change something, or is it something that you guys are going to be voted in and just go status quo? And whoever wants to take that first. George, I'd gladly jump on that if you want. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> so as far as like uh, what's going on with the district and blaming things on the pandemic, um, every district in the nation has faced that. There's a lot of districts that are flourishing now because of it, because they knew how to run a budget. They knew how to run a district. And then there's ones that fell right on their face because, again, they didn't. So look at where we are. When it comes to leadership and it comes to how we're running the district, I don't think there'd be 15 candidates if we were all um, confident on how things were being run at the district as it is. So when it comes to uh, looking at things like that, I'm going to come right out and tell you that I think we definitely need to look at leadership. What's going on? Why are so many people like stepping down, going other places for the same amount of money? What you're going to find out with professionals is there's deep rooted problems. And a lot of times when a professional is not happy, they'll step down and they'll go somewhere else and they're not going to make a big stink about it. And you're not going to hear anything about it unless you interview them personally and find out what's going on. So we had talked about, you know, what is going on? Do we have exit interviews? These are things that they, they should have exit interviews. Like Jen had said, because you want to talk to these people and find out exactly what is going on and why are they leaving for the same amount of money, but yet traveling 20, 15, 20 miles. So I, I think I've, Put down my position as to exactly how I feel about leadership and what I'd like to do. Now, I'd also like to say I'll give anyone a fair shake 
and give anyone a chance. We have to take a look at what we have and work with what we have. But um, at the same time, I think it's evident what's going on that we need to take a look at what's, we have to take a real hard look at what's going on and be honest with ourselves and be honest with the people who we have in, in those positions. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, you're up. I agree with John. I think we need to, I will give anybody a fair shake. I've said that. Um, I think I've been giving a fair shake. I've attended a lot of meetings, seeing a lot of stuff. Um, the good part is with what is going on, you have eight of us running for five seats, so at least four will be totally new. So with that aspect, you will be getting new leadership at the board level. And it seems like, you know, the ones that we're talking now and have for a while, we're getting on not totally the same page, but we're on similar pages and we know how to communicate back and forth, um, which I think is good. So that part where the board comes, we will be seeing a new leadership, which I think should have been done a while ago. Um, I just think we had too many status quos going on, things like that. I think the board members that are going to be left are ready to see some changes too, and uh, having talked to some of them. And then we do need to look at the different culture administrative ways of going on. I think some of them aren't as happy, um, but we need to sit down with them where they can come and be honest and let us know because they're the professionals. They know what's going on. They're in the trenches more than we are. We're looking at it, but sitting at a board meeting, you hardly hear anything. It's a lot of silence and just uh, votes that go on. So that's where you've got to go out and see. And I think with what you've seen with the group here, we're willing to do that job and go out and find it. And then at that point, we should be able to see what our greatest um, aspects are that we want to take and go. And we can also see what weaknesses we're seeing in this district and work on them as quickly as we can. Okay. Clint, you're right, buddy. I just unmuted you. You're all right. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as leadership just, and direction we, of the district. Sorry, good. What's that? No, God, I messed up. Good. Okay. We definitely got to take a hard, in-depth look at the direction we're going because some direction, some things we're doing okay. Other things we definitely are not. And we need to look at all of it and look at the causes behind it. And comes back to some of our communication between board administrators, teachers. And right now we have, we don't know what direction our current board has been giving our administrators. So we need to see where we're at and work from that, see where our problems are and see if our leadership can change direction or not and decide where we need to go. Okay. Mark, you're up. I unmuted you. Good. Yeah, I think that um, I think there's been a lot of bad decisions the last few years, very poor communication. Um, if leadership was really good, you wouldn't have this many people running for school board right now. This has all been said. I do think that uh, the, the current board and admin have been put into a tough position based off the last 20 years. I've said that repeatedly, but that doesn't give them an excuse to not move forward in a better direction. And I think that they need to be held accountable. Now, we have to get on the same board. Everybody needs to be on the same team because there is only one team. We need to work together and we need to build people up. And if we don't have the right people in the right positions, we need to move forward in a positive direction. Okay. Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Am I? Uh, okay. <laughs> so. Um, not to be repetitive, but um, I agree with many things that everybody's saying, and definitely the communication is key. Um, I feel that there's um, quite a few negatives going on, and without everybody working together, um, I think this is a huge problem. There's so much disagreement, and I'm not saying everybody has to agree, but agree to disagree and figure out what the best thing is to do in the situation. Um, like the lack of communication and the one thing that bothers me is 
like the exit interviews for how many people are leaving good people um why are they leaving what is going on is it the culture um and i feel like i know the one administrator um she left and she's getting paid a thousand dollars less a year than she was making in berwick so for someone to leave and take a pay cut i definitely think there's a lot of issues um that need to be addressed and we just need to figure them out and we just need to make a positive change in this district okay Leah. I think with leadership comes accountability. And I think accountability starts at the top. Um, it starts at the top within the district, and that includes the board members. It includes all of us holding each other accountable. It includes us being accountable for the choices that we make. Um, the decisions that we make have impacts on the entire community. It has impacts on the, you know, all the teachers, all the students, all the taxpayers. Um, so I think I think accountability is really at the forefront when it comes to leadership, and um, yeah, I just I it all comes down to accountability. Okay, all right, good. Now, uh, here's what I'm going to uh, suggest here, and, and the thing that I like here is that we're all this is an open forum. Whether you agree with somebody else or you don't, that is very important. And it, being in business, I see that as a very a positive thing. So no one's throwing anybody under the bus. Nobody's saying, hey, this person's bad or this person's not bad. John, you even said, hey, we got to see where we're at before we make any decisions of what, we, what we're going to do. My question would be, and this is to everybody, so whether you want to jump in on this, I, I won't exactly put you on, on mute and mute. So anyone could jump in on this. How do you make changes if you're at some point, there's going to be a lot of uh, blowback from either the taxpayers or the teachers. How do you put a position, how do you put a proposition together where everybody wins? Because I think everybody has to win, but there has to be sacrifices on both sides. How do you guys choose which sacrifices to make? Because someone's gonna be mad, right? If, am I right or am I wrong? You're, I think you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> you're wrong? You, there's, there can't always be a winner. There, no, 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 no. I, no, I, didn't, no, I didn't say that. I said there's going to be sacrifice on both sides. Okay. We, there's a win-win. Yeah. But there's got to be sacrifice on both sides because I, I know just by just by what I'm hearing is even though, and I know the, the um, a, a full disclosure, my wife is a teacher. Okay? Oh, this is done. <laughs> so at, at the top, I, I get it. She's at the top of the pay scale. Um, some of those teachers want more. Okay. Every, I don't know. I don't even know a millionaire who says, no, I, I'm good. I don't even know one. So, so really, that's money is a big issue. It just is because we've never been in this situation where, in I mean, in my lifetime, really, where the inflationary uh, index is so high, it really is. And and even look at my food cost; it's incredible. And just today, I saw something where you know Visa, Mastercard. When you guys swipe the card, it's now at like four percent. So four percent on top of what I'm paying is now included in that price. So things are extremely tight. So at what point do you guys make a negotiation where you're both everyone's starting to get happy? Because I think, Jen, what you said with the with the out interviews is very important because I think we're we know who's was leaving and was like, hey man, I'm leaving for less money. Because it just there's something here. I've never seen it such a divide. And I mean, it's across the country. We we all know that, but there's such a divide. We're such a small community. There has to be a win-win somewhere. Are you guys willing to like sit down and really, uh, and, and to me, you guys are very transparent here to say, this is what I feel is, is wrong and not be, and, and be okay. If you get the blowback, cause you're going to, because not if, and if you're doing it, if you're getting blowback, you're doing something right. But you, are you guys willing and prepared to put it out there for the taxpayers, but also the teachers are taxpayers too. They're, they're involved in this. And you want to win-win. Are you guys willing to put yourself there and put it out there on the line for you guys? Well, George, can I ask you a question with that? Sure. Can we have yeah. an open for format here? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. keep everybody on the screen like we are? Yeah. Yep. As a business owner, um, mm -hmm. and you and I both can relate to this because we both do the same mm -hmm. thing and right. many other people. When it comes to the, the teachers that are at the highest scale, mm -hmm. they're there because they've been there for a long time. So I agreed. When, when you look at this, right? When it comes to the best decision for you, for the teachers, and for the taxpayer, let's say you had 
whatever budget that you have that you can give raises to. We're just mm -hmm. going to call that 100%. You got to divvy up that 100% amongst your highest paid, your middle class, and your teachers coming in, right? Correct. So as a smart decision, where are you going to give the most money out? To the people you've had for 30 years or the people that you want to attract? Okay. Okay. I, oh. I, okay. I, I got, I'm okay with See that. where I'm right. going with this. Right. But you have to look at, at, at one thing, as I'm going to say, is how do you decipher, because I'm going to tell you, you're going to have teachers in here who are just going to, eh, they're going to get paid. They're going to get their benefits. They're going to go. Uh, like Mark was saying, you got to get the right people and the right seats on the bus to drive that bus. You do. You have a leader at the top. You how do. do you decipher that? Because and it's a, a risk and reward type okay. thing, right? Yep. So okay. are, how risky is it going to be for you to like take a teacher who's been here for 30 years and say, you know, you what's their likelihood that they're going to go? You and I both know that their likelihood they're going to ride it out and they're going to, <clears throat> they're going to retire. So let's call yep. that budget 100% again. Mm -hmm. It's common sense that you're going to take that budget and divvy it up amongst the people you want to attract down in the lowest scale and maybe some on in the middle scale as well. It'd be great if you can give something to the people who are on the top scale. Now, from what I understand, once you reach top step at Berwick, that's it. You're top step forever. So it'd be nice to take a look at that and see if there's something that you can do to compensate those people at the top end of the scale. But my opinion, running it like a business I would take the majority, the lion's share of the budget, if there is a surplus that can be given, and I'm going to divvy it out more on the lower end. We've talked about that. You would do right. that too. Am I wrong? No, no, you're, you're right. My question would be, is there, um, is there uh, at the top, is there a um, increase of cost of living? That goes in, or I, no, I think they get the increase of cost of living, and that's it. And and to be fair on that, that's usually a set a number. When you look at what's happened with inflation around exactly. around the nation, it's far outpaced what people have had in their contract as the cost of living, which is average about three percent. Inflation has far outpaced that the last couple of years. So you definitely would want to take a look at that and say mm -hmm. that cost of living was it was it a reality? Did it actually help? So you have you, you definitely have to address that at a minimum. But when it comes to compensation for employees, like we talked about earlier, you're going to want to give out the lion's share to the people at the bottom to try to keep them and retain them or to try to attract them in the first place. That's mm -hmm. just a common sense type of thing. And that's how I look at it anyway. I'm sorry if it comes across as harsh, but to the point, no. but I don't pull punch as much. And there it is. I don't think it comes across harsh at all. I, I don't. I think I think. Um, mm -hmm. And what I've always tried to do is look at it in a business aspect because essentially this is a business that Absolutely. it just kind of is. It kind of is because look, if the people aren't paying taxes and whatever, there's no money. I mean, essentially, John, I think the district is kind of broke. That's we are, right. and that's why I don't want to promise anything until we get there and we get to look at the budget and say right. this is what we have. You know, like saying that we're going to help this, you know, the middle or the low or the whatever. Mm -hmm. I, the first thing I really want to do when we get there. And it might sound funny or comical is put on the brakes, which was what Washington needs to do. Go there, assess the situation, put Good on the luck. brakes. Good luck. Figure out what we're doing. Figure out what we have and then go from there before we make any kind of campaign promises or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I think what John's saying is important. And, you know, the scientist in me loves data. And I think it's so important for us to collect as much information as possible before making these decisions and to make sure we're hearing from the people that these decisions are going to affect. And Mark touched on it before where he, you know, mentioned about um, the budget and we don't, we don't technically know all of the numbers involved in this. And it's important for us to get that prior to making big decisions and making sure that we are well informed. So I, I think you have to look at this with an objective realist mentality. OK, we have numbers. We don't have them yet. But once we have these numbers, we look at them, we see where, where is money being spent? Can there be cuts made to discretionary funds? Can we cut back on some of these things that maybe we're not using every day? Um, and can we can we then create a win win situation for compensation and staff? But uh, we don't know what those expenses are yet. We don't know where we could make those cuts. There are things in the governor's budget that could give us a nice influx of cash every year with the level up funds. Um, that could be a game changer for us, as are the, the anticipated tax increases. But we can't rely on that every single year. Um, so I think when you're objectively looking at numbers in a business sense, 
a business cannot spend more money than they bring in on an annual basis or you go bankrupt unless you're the federal government. Okay. <laughs> we are not the federal government. We're the public school system. And if we keep on doing that, we're going to be in big, big trouble. So we need to rein in the spending, look at things objectively and make smart decisions that are going to be beneficial to everybody. I think we also have to look at getting some passive income, which I think has been neglected for a long while. We have money sitting in different funds that are used for different things, and they're sitting in a case where you're not getting any interest. I think some of that needs to be looked at too, which will then be able to you know, build some other things up. And John's right, we need to just stop and say, where is this money? They're saying it's in this fund, but where is it located? You know, is it, the, you know, a case that we can get it into, especially with interest rates going up now, we can easily do that. And they have this new business manager, which I thought was kind of ironic that he came in last night and he's still trying to figure out all the money and where it is. So hopefully yeah. he'll have that by the time we get there, that then we will be able to see where some of this is. This Nancy, that was discussed at a financial meeting a couple months ago. Yeah, I was and there. I, yeah, and I did, I don't know where I saw it, but I know that they had it located somewhere where it was interest bearing. I think it was under 2% though. And you're right in that we could uh, potentially move a lot of that fund into something that's got a higher yield at a 4 or 5%. Well, and they did after that meeting, they did move some of it back and kept some of it in the trust, which actually has gone up to about 4.5, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it took that meeting and the comments coming out there, but that was the whole thing. It has been moved some, but I think there are some other things that need to be done. Okay. Uh, Jenner, Clint, Clint, and if they can put their point in, please. Yes. I just feel there's a lot of um, frivolous spending, a lot of spending on things that we don't need to spend money on. And we should be investing that money into the teachers because they are the core of the district. They need to be paid what they deserve because um, th that's where our kids are getting our education from. So spending money on needless things um, is ridiculous. So like, I'd like to see the budget, see everything where it's broken down and see where we could actually save money so we can give more money to where it needs to go. Clint, Clint, if you could. Yeah. Um, like I said, we don't actually know what we have in the budget, what's there, what's not, what, where money's even being spent. There's very little public explanation of where money goes. We were told in a meeting not long ago that they already project next year. We're going to be in red as a district. We're going to spend more than we take in, which we can't support. So we need to like was said, we need to just take a deep dive into our budget, see where our money is, where we can spend money, where we can't. And as far as compromising and working with all sides and making everybody happy, sometimes I think the best compromise is when nobody's really real happy. Everybody's got to give and take a little bit. And when we're doing that, I think the biggest question we got to look at is what is best for our kids? How what is going to support them the best? And that's what we need to do. And here is, here is one thing I want to, I want to make perfectly clear on this, uh, this podcast here. Uh, so that when the people do look at this and they do see it um, and they, they're trying to get each and everyone's point of view, I think they really have to understand that the district is broke. It, it, as a businessman looking at this, because of your expenses that you have here, and you don't have a certain amount in that budget that's put away, uh, that's a scary place to be. So I think that, you know, and this is not to scare anybody. It is a very, it's close there, guys. And I think you guys all know that it's close, uh, that something has to be done. So I think you guys coming on and really kind of putting it out there is transparency. I think that's what's missing in Washington is the transparency of what is going on. Why is our money, where's it going? And I think that helps. That Because, I, I mean, if I don't know where, if I, if, I'll give you an example. If, if my kid asks me, hey, give me 20 bucks, I want to know where it's going. I mean, I mean, we're, we're not going buying everybody, you know, candy. Where's that money going? And wh what are we doing with it? And what's our return? Well, return my return should be, you know, goodwill with my kid that I would give him money. But return for us would be we're getting good teachers. We're getting, we're getting good education. 
value for our tax dollars. Are, are we clear on that? That that's kind of where we're at here. Okay. Did anyone have a, an additional point to that last one? I thought John, you would you jumped in there at the end. I didn't. Uh, know I do, George. I want to tie a, back to a question that we talked about before with leadership sure. and mm -hmm. and the budget. <clears throat> Last night's meeting, we had it. We're looking for a new pool director now. And Correct. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not going to mention names, but the person who was doing it, if I could have hand chose anyone to do it, it would have been that person. Great mm -hmm. leader, great organiza organizational skills. Did things with the pool to try to like have pool parties and things like that. She stepped Correct. down. Now we're looking yeah. for somebody else. So when it comes back to leadership, what does it tell you about that? That that person stepped down right away. When it comes to budgeting and it comes to leadership, when it comes to budgeting, we voted to close a school. That vote went through. And then at the a couple of meetings after that, some of us were at, there was argument about bids. Who was going to do the renovation at Salem? Who was going to make the cafeteria bigger? We talked about putting it out to bid for somebody else. These are all things that should have been taken care of before you voted to uh, close a school. I'd like to make that point when people are watching this, that this is the leadership you have going on right now. They're making decisions before they know all the, the data. It, it was really John, bad. John, quick. who? So people do people know who's accountable for that? Or is it, or is it not? Is it a school board or is it a, 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 a significant someone who's making it? I, I think the things that have been pushed have been pushed by an individual and kind of tried to get pushed through the school board. Okay. Uh, either Either way. All right. Either way, it's it's not done the way it should have. The, you should have all your bids in. What exactly is it going to cost you? Who's going to be doing what? Those decisions should have been on the table, and everyone should have known before we took a vote to close Nascapec. In, in my experience sitting on boards, you have to prompt who's presenting the material with the right questions to get those answers. And I don't think that's been done the last few years. And I'm hoping with the new turnover in the board that we can start asking those right questions to get more information to make more well-informed decisions. Right. And there's, you know, like John said, there was no plan ahead of this. And that's something that doesn't sit well with the community. And we shouldn't be rushing renovations at the last minute um, to accommodate a timeline that we're now under. And, uh, you know, so good leadership where, where do, has a plan. Where do we stand with that? As of right now, if I was going to go right now, I went down to, this, to 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 look at the school books. Where do we stand at that? We didn't know that. We didn't know the answer to that question at any point in the last three years. You're you're expecting us to answer that now? Well, no, no, no. no. I'm saying if I went in and said, "Where are we at with the?" Uh, because uh, evidently we're taking bids. It, it, we don't it, know. It, so nobody knows. They, uh, I believe they announced last night the bid was accepted. Okay. <laughs> But they didn't it say was what mentioned it was. at the school board meeting, and they made some kind of deadline. They made some kind of deadline people were positive about. Um, when they put it out for a company, they told them what they wanted to spend before they put a bid out with no parameters of what they actually wanted done. Wait, so am, I, am, like am, I one, am I the only one confused? No. Okay. I just want to make sure because I'm, I'm looking around. I'm thinking, I thought we were closing, but then we're going somewhere else, and now we're doing taking bids. That's a little strange. To me, and I'm that's sure exactly what happened. They, okay, they decided to close really? Nesquik, and they were still talking about bids two meetings later. Who was going to renovate? Wait, who was going to renovate Salem? Does the public know this? Is this out there or no? If they're at the meeting, well, I'm putting it out there now. Okay, and I, 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 to be quite honest with you, most people don't go to the meetings. Um, that's why I think this is a good forum. I think, and I would actually invite uh, anyone from the administration to come on. I would. If they wanted to do it, if that's something you guys were interested in. I would in. love for all of the school board meetings to be live streamed on Facebook. It should be. It should be. I they do it do in big cities. Hey, there's a Potter Brand podcast. We gladly host it. You just like and subscribe if you could. But uh, cheap plug. Okay. Does, does, does it come with a bagel basket? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what it, 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 me up. Also, they'd all sit there quiet. And I mean, that's the whole board meeting. Well, that's, that is a problem. That is a problem, Nancy, because I think what happens is People, um, there are people that are quiet that don't want to say much, and then when it does happen, someone says something that gets a little wonky, and people feel I'm just going to shut up. I'm not going to say nothing. That's what I feel. They're worried about retaliation or someone getting a little. And I, I, unfortunately, I've never had that. I'm. I will speak up. I will say you know mine. I may not always say it you know right, but that's it. But I think that's what 
this whole group is, as you can see, we're willing to stand up and talk. But, mo you know, when you go to a board meeting, it's just silent. So you'd have a very hard time on a podcast just taking care of it, George. Would be kind of <laughs> would be kind of weird. Do some yes. <laughs> It's your job as a school director to be asking these hard questions. That's your job. And, and be and civil in disagreement. Making the choice. Right. Right. We, right. You know, yeah. we can we can get along while we disagree, and I think that's a really important thing to do. And it's something that yeah. a lot of boards don't do. No, now, I, I give the benefit yeah. of the doubt. At last night's meeting, the things that I thought should have been talked about, the plan, what do we want to implement? Are the classrooms getting big enough to accommodate these kids? All the stuff that the public really would want to know. Not a word. Now, again, I'm going to err to the side of maybe this stuff is talked about behind closed doors that we don't know about. That's the that's issue. still not the right choice. The public needs to know what the plan is, what's going forward, because as somebody who's running for school board, I went to the meeting last night thinking that maybe I would hear a little bit of information about what the plan is and how we're going to move forward. And that wasn't the case. Now, the time that I went before that, I was appalled at the fact that we were still talking about bids to renovate Salem School after we had closed, decided to close Nescapec. To me, I, I couldn't believe that business was done that way. It, it's just a horrible way to do business. You, you just don't do that. Everything should have been on the table, weighed your options before you went and chose to close Nescapec. Now, another thing that you brought up, George, was would we be willing to vote to reopen Nescapec? It's not that easy. And that's the problem with going ahead and making a knee-jerk decision like what happened. Paperwork was submitted to the state. The state is already expecting Nescapec to be closed. It's not just a simple vote to, to open Nescapec. It's another whole big paper trail and a whole big process to reverse this decision. Mm -hmm. This was why closing Nescapec at a, at a whim was a horrible decision. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say... Uh, reversing it. I just thought maybe there was a chance that someone would come in last minute and reverse it. And then we're back to square one again, which we were five years ago. You know what I mean? That's that's what I meant. I didn't say, can we reverse it? Meaning I think it's a good idea or a bad idea. I just thought, okay, if someone comes in and wants to throw a monkey wrench in and say, let's see about reversing this because there is, there is some that people that, that do feel it should be open. I think you're all right in, 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 in one instance that you said, you have to have a plan where we are where it just seems like we're all over the place with that you guys coming in this giving the opportunity to say this it is a strong stance that you guys are taking by taking that first initial step so i hope the people watching this are saying that you guys do have an idea of what you want that being said you guys will be held accountable i believe because you guys are putting yourself out there and are you guys all willing to take that risk uh, progress doesn't and, come without accountability and you have to be able to accept that criticism to really reflect on what your decisions are going to be. You have the whole community and a school district that you're going to be in charge of. You better be willing to take that criticism. Anonymous in the newspaper, on Facebook, or wherever it may be, you have to be able to put your neck out there and make some very difficult decisions. And this is a small community. We know a lot of people that work in the district. There's going to be hurt feelings, too. And that's, that's a, a downside to this, but it's an important thing that we need to do. And I don't, I don't think, I don't want to speak for anyone else. This decision was not an easy one for me personally to do this. Um, you know, I have young kids and a lot of us have young kids and it's taking away time from our families and it's, um, it's a big decision. And there, like you said, there's a lot of public scrutiny that comes along with it because this affects everyone in the community. And that's, that's hard to convey to people sometimes until they get their tax bill and they're saying, well, wait a minute, what are we doing? Um, you know, you're talking about schools and people think, oh, it doesn't affect me. I don't have kids in the school until they get their tax bill. Um, so this this decision was not made lightly. And, um, you know, it's something that we we all signed up for. And there will be pros and cons for sure. The, the only so, upside to this is that we have the opportunity to make the school better. And when you make the school better, you make the community better. So Leah mm -hmm. is right in that this impacts every person in this community. Okay. Um, that being said, um, the taxes hadn't gone up in, ooh, geez, a while. Um, I know I get two tax bills, uh, my house and the building here. Um, so now, as this impending tax increase, it has to happen. We know that. Uh, am I correct that, that that was on, that's on the table? 
right they already voted on one. Okay. Um, I do see it going up a lot more. Now, unfortunately, you guys didn't get the backlash. If you guys if you guys are, are voted in, you're gonna get it. It's almost like you know, the guy who came after Joe Paterno or the guy who comes after George Curry, you're gonna get it because this is what's gonna happen. Um, how do you combat that? Um, are you are you thinking maybe do it all at one shot, rip the band-aid off, or incrementally put it up and and then put a put a, a plan in place to say, hey, we gotta get to here. I don't want to do it all at once, but we do have to get here at some point. I mean, I know it's unpopular. I know it's unpopular. It has to be incremental. It has to be. Yeah. Well, this first one, this first one's a big one. First one's a big one. But after that, you have to be incremental. And that's the mistake they made in the past. If they would have just put a a small, you know, 25% or 0.25 up each year, nobody's going to feel that. I shouldn't say you're not going to feel it, but you're going to feel it a lot less than 5% right now. Right. 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 And I think we're all in agreement that this was a perfect storm for the, you know, inflationary uh, index. And all of a sudden here we are. It's not just five right now. You know what I mean? It's not five. You're feeling it. You're legitimately feeling it. And the fact that now the banks are tightening up a little bit. You're not going to get the equity from your home. Things are tightening up. Um, That being said, is there anything in in place? And I just this is a question off the top of my head. The taxes are going to go up, the school taxes. Is there anything in place that you guys can do where they can pay their taxes like weekly? And the only reason why I say that is because I know a lot of people who get this tax bill and it might be 1500 bucks, right? It could just be, I don't know, whatever it is. They can't afford it. Next thing you know, I'll get it next week. I'll get it next week. Next thing you know, boom, they're, they're, they're a sheriff sale. That's George, a it's question. a great the idea if they can do that. Absolutely. Central mm-hmm. already does that, like in thirds. Um, Burrow does it. Um Connie Ganger does it for her people that you do it quarterly with her and she will take it. I don't think people can, I don't think you can, you can also escrow directly into your mortgage. Through your yeah, what, I, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm saying is like, this. don't have mortgages, but she will take that, that she will, you could actually come over to her and work out that if you wanted to pay it monthly, but she prefers. Oh, really? Okay. Well, see, I didn't know that. That's something that, cause I think that isn't, that's an issue now with, with uh, people now that want to have these taxes, things done, um, taken out because, it, and it just gets to be uh, a snowball. Yeah. And then it, it causes a lot of stress. And next thing you know, you're not paying your school taxes. You're going to foreclosure or sheriff sale. It, 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 is that something on your level? In townships and others, but I will tell you, Burrow, Burrow, you are allowed to do it by quarters. Okay. All right, good. That, 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 actually, I didn't know that. A lot of times who you're impacting here are the senior citizens on a fixed right. budget. You know, and, to get and they're looking at either paying for medication or paying their tax bill. And it's it's an unfortunate situation. And for those people, you don't want to um, you don't want to do huge increases at a time because right. they're who's significantly affected by this. And more more than likely they don't have kids in the district. And right. they're like, wait, I'm paying a, a tax bill that I don't have kids in the district. I know you all got everyone's gotta pay. Right. It's just what it is to, to support the town and the school. Um, so that being said, uh, on that at that end, uh, where do we see the school five years? Anybody want to take that? I'm hoping in a much better place than it is now. You know, I, I hope it's a place where people want to work. I hope it's a place where people want to bring their kids to learn. Um, I hope it's a place where people see futures for themselves. And um, I hope the community is is behind it. I think it depends on who gets elected, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I do, I do. I, um, but I go back to where we've been for the last two decades. It hasn't moved. That's what one of the reasons why I had you guys on. This thing has not moved. Think about it. We're we need we're to in make a place, progress forward. Yeah, I just want something like. W- Honestly, I can remember saying this when this whole thing happened years ago. I said, we're going to be in the same position in five years because we're not moving anything. We're not doing anything. I would I would actually I would actually disagree with you that it hasn't moved. I think it's gotten worse. Um, And I hate to say that, but, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up in the district and. Oh, we froze. Oh no, we froze. Okay, but that's what she'll get that. Note. But um, and I don't want she's just frozen. She's oh, right. there you go. Now you're back. Go ahead. <laughs> and you I think it, I think it's you know, 
I know you said I, think, I know you said it, that you disagree because it got it's gotten worse. I, I didn't say um, it, it's gotten better. I'm just saying we haven't made the progress in. Okay, let's make the school district good. Uh, like we're just kind of like okay, we're status quo. We're not raising taxes. We're just doing this. Steps are the same. This is good. Our scores are here, which we're going to get to next, and that's where we are. Now the perfect storm comes. We're behind the eight ball. This is what's going on, and it's the holy crap. What are we doing? So and I think that's why 15 of us showed up to run for right. these positions. Yeah. So again, I go back to my question. Where where do you, uh, and Leah, you've answered that. Um, where do you see us in five years? If you're plan if you're elected, let's say you're taking where do you see, where do you want to see us? Is there a I'm not gonna say a certain district that you that you look say, hey, let's model that or whatever. Is it, where do you see us at in a better position? Or are we gonna get worse before it gets better? I I I'd like to see us be the first to do something unique and different. You know, we there's so many different avenues to take the public education. And I feel like we're we've lost sight of what school is actually meant to be. It's to pre prepare kids for the future. Okay, but we don't know what the future of those kids are. So we need to give them avenues. You know, we, we could talk about what Central is doing with um, their curriculum and pathways. There's ways to start that in the elementary school give them the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, and then give them electives right in the mm -hmm. elementary school and bring them up through the middle school and high school doing those same things. Get them involved in the workforce. We're talking about budgeting taxes, property taxes for adults, because we have financial illiteracy in this country because the public school system is failing them. So what I would like to see come out of Berwick is for Berwick to be the new model for what public education can be in a small town by making tough decisions, by be, being forward thinking, and by embracing uh, the ecosystem of experts within our community and not just relying on the leadership within the, the walls. I agree with you, Mark, on that. I think we need to do our own. Um, I'm the old folk here, and I can tell you when I taught way back when, it was always, well, California did it. Well, it, well within five years, then Pennsylvania would do it because California did it. But by then, California realized it didn't work. So then they, you know, turned around and did something else. I think we need to, as a group, start thinking again. Let's not model against others because they're making the mistakes and they're building from that. We're going in there and we're going to make the same. I would rather see us look and get a group together and think outside the box and find new ways and new forms of education. And we have bunches of professionals that are here and they, if we start listening to what they think we need to do, I think we're going to be able to take and head in a new direction that's going to build us back up. And that's what I'd like to see in five years where people outside of this district are looking or coming to us and saying, how and why are you doing this and we be the model one and i think we can do it in five years okay good if, if nobody else has anything it's it's um george what's the bruce lee quote take what is useful and discard what is not i have no idea what you're talking about you're a combat guy i thought you would know yeah but i, well, I don't know. You're, bruce lee, i'm what, 47. <laughs> what districts across the nation are doing a good job what can we learn from them? What can we take back to Berwick and do better? Okay, what's not working in those districts? Cut it out. We don't have to reinvent the wheel fully, but we can be creative with what's working in other places. Well, can we implement that here? Absolutely. Okay. And that's what we're looking for here in town. We are. We really are. Now, one of the questions I'm going to ask is one of the questions that came in it was about test scores and our scoring system. How valuable are they? Do they mean anything? And I say this because, uh, let's say, take out this level here, uh, high school, go to the college level. It's gone up, oh, I think, what, 1,300% the tuition? Is it 1,300%, I think? But our education hasn't gone up 1,300%. Based on scores and kind of pigeonholing kids saying, oh, you got to go to college, you got to come out with $150,000 worth of debt, this is what you have to do. They're not prepared. I mean, they're, they're really not prepared. I mean, I wasn't prepared. Well, first of all, I didn't finish high school, so I clearly wasn't prepared. Um, they're not prepared to take on something like that. So 
how do we rate sc our scoring for the uh, SAT test? I, I think that's what they're called now, PSATs. How do you guys rate that? And do you do you hold do you hold a lot of water to that? And putting kids, and this is something that I've discussed privately with some people, having kids, and I think they start them at what third grade, right around there, uh, doing that that might be a little much. Uh, is that something that you change, or is it on a state level, or how do we how do we improve that? Because our scores are clearly a little bit lower; they just are. How do we improve that? I think you, I think you start to improve that by listening to the people administering those tests. You know, testing isn't something that any of us want to participate in as parents, and we don't want to see our kids go through it. But it's something that the state currently requires. Um, it's something that is often linked to funding, and I think the the best way to improve test scores is to ask the people administering those tests, our teachers, where they feel we could improve, what we could do for them to help them improve, um, to help the students improve. Um, I, you know, standardized tests, they're, it is a gauge to a certain extent for how you're doing as a district, um, but some students just don't test well. And, um, I, th I just think the most important thing is to start listening to what the teachers feel we could do to provide them more support um, to get through these types. Oh, that breeze line. I tell you, that breeze <laughs> line, it's killing us over here. She, I uh, think as uh, board members, it's something we could do to have these discussions with our representatives and say, you know, you, we have these keystone exams and we're required to take them. And you give five other options for keystone exams, but these options aren't really something that a district like Berwick can help students with because they require money. Um, they would require students to take other tests in order to pass high school, but the district doesn't pay for those exams. So if a student can't afford to take them, that's not an option for them. And you're stuck with the keystone exams. If, if a student can't get an internship at a local business to complete this requirement for the keystones, um, you know, they're, they're stuck taking these tests. And I, I think districts currently are stuck. Um, but I think that, you know, board members, not just us, but any other board members in any other district should be having these conversations with representatives to say, how could we improve this for everyone? Mark? I think test scores are absolutely worthless. Um, they are mandated, so it's not like we can stop taking them. However, we can change the way we take them until we can fight the state regulations and make them go away. I think the way we make them better is we align the testing, the way you give the test, to the developmental model of young kids. Right now, we're putting a third grader with a 15-minute attention span into a room to take a test for two hours after he was just given a protein bar with 30 grams of sugar in it. They're getting recessed once a day, and then they come back and they take another two hour test. That is not gonna tell you anything about how smart that third grade student is. So what I would do is get the sugar out of the school. I would take that two hour test and I would cut it up into however many 15 or 20 minute tests and give them a 15 minute walk outside in between. I would not mention testing at all the entire year to the teachers or to the students other than, hey, we're going to test these dates. You do your best engaging with students and connecting with them year round. It'll help with discipline. It will get them engaged. It will make them try harder when we actually take these tests. And then your test scores will go up. But I am not a believer at all in the test scores. I don't think they measure anything. And I think that if you look at national statistics, we are the lowest we have been in 30 years in reading and math. And that has coincided directly with PSSA scores. So obviously not working. Is that our district or just in nationwide? General? Okay. Oh, geez. All right. 80, by, by the Department of Education metric alone, I think it's something like 80% of students are falling behind, oh. according to test scores. All right. And so let's keep using those. That's smart. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, we have mm -hmm. to do the tests because, of course, that's how our funding comes in. We can't do away with it because we lose state, federal funding with it. So we do. But again, I don't think we should put as much um, basis on it. I think the way that we can bring the test scores up 
is starting when they're in kindergarten, first grade, and things like that, and really push reading and get the supplemental resources down to those teachers who, again, we should have smaller class sizes there for those ones in the very beginning. And I think really starting with getting the kids to be able to read, once they're able to read, they're gonna be able to go with the math and things like that, start simple, but it doesn't matter whether you're going on to college, it doesn't matter if you don't even finish the high school, you still need to know how to read. You wouldn't have been able to put this on, George, if you couldn't have read some things and that. And that's where I think reading needs to be a basis and it needs to be started so early in our schools. And unfortunately, we have, again, some of the class sizes going up and we also have that we aren't giving the Title I and different things. And sometimes we need to test those kids at an earlier age so that we are able to get that supplemental in. And I think once you get just general reading skills up, I think you're going to see your test scores go up. Okay. And we're waiting on uh, Jen, John, uh, John or Clint, whoever wants to jump in. I'll go, go because my phone's about to die if I can. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have it plugged in, but I'm in my car, so it's not really charging. So hopefully I'll be able to stay on. Um, I think that basic education, these these elementary kids need to be taken off the computers. I understand they have to do IXL, iReady. Everything's on the computer. But in my experience, my son's eight years old. I At night, get a book. I have him read it. He knew how to read very well in kindergarten because of doing this. These kids need interaction without a computer. And I think it helps them greatly to succeed because they're not just listening to a story or they're not just watching something. They need the interaction and they need the pen and paper. And then if you start them early and they're learning early that way, I think it will help them succeed when they get into the um, older grades. Clint, go ahead. Um, yeah, test scores, I think, have a very limited usefulness. I mean, they may gauge a little bit, but I think we, as school districts and society, have put way too much emphasis on it. You hear a lot of stuff come out of schools where they're teaching kind of to the test. They know what's going to be on them, and they try to teach that. And I think, especially in our lower grades, we need to return back to the very basics, the building blocks of education, make sure they're strong in reading and math and their grammar. And if they have solid building blocks, make sure they're on pace where they belong for their age each year, then they'll have a good solid foundation they can always build upon because right now a lot of stuff is kind of pushed through because this massive testing and stuff takes so much time out of their year that they don't really have a solid basis or foundation to build on. And then when they go to the more advanced level of things, they're kind of already behind because they don't have that basis that they need. So we need to work on that. If they're strong in their basics, they're naturally going to bring their test scores up, I think. And we also need to, put in a lot more critical thinking and problem solving. Let these kids try to encourage them to figure out how to solve things on their own rather than just this is what it is and this is the answer and this is the one way to do it. Okay. And uh, John? Well, George, there's a lot of things that we touched on and I'm gonna revisit this subject again, things that I brought up before. Because of my nature and what I've done, what my degree is in, what I do for a living, um, different things, I took electives in college for history because I love history so much. I think that you need to learn from history and see what happened before so you don't repeat those things in the, in the future. I want to bring up Mulberry Street Elementary School again, and I'm going to do this time and time again. The current superintendent likes to put a lot of emphasis on social economics being a big factor of why our testing is the way it is. I'd like to um, call out that fact and say, I don't agree with that because Mulberry Street was 
was our history that we learned from that. We should have. When it comes to social economics, when you look at the Berwick area, it's kind of hard to be a place or an area that's more socially challenged economically than the Mulberry Street area. However, their testing scores were better than almost any other school in the area, in the district, because they had about 11 to 14 kids per class size. It's So when you look at history, it's not a secret how you get your test scores up. Student to teacher ratio is by far the biggest um, metric for that. We've seen it. We've done it. We've been there. So throwing out all kinds of ideas that don't gravitate around that. Nancy had, had mentioned it too about classroom sizes and amongst other candidates have mentioned classroom size too. In my opinion, that is the biggest factor when it comes to our test scores. Now, Mark had mentioned about test scoring. I'm not going to argue um, one way or the other when it comes to test scoring, but I will tell you this. Unfortunately, when it comes to test scoring, it is a litmus paper when it comes to attracting other families in the area. When they look at your district to see where you scored, and they look at Central and see how they've scored, a lot of times they're going to go down there and buy a house in that district. I've seen it a million times. We have a lot of what I call nuclear nomads that come in the area and buy homes here because we've hired them from out of the area. Very few are looking to settle here. Most of them look to settle in Central. So as unfortunate as it is, the testing does hold weight, and we do need to address that. Um, but again, I'd like to you know reiterate the point Let's look at our history. Let's look at what worked. Don't reinvent the wheel. And when I say about small classroom sizes, this incorporates the plan about why we closed Nescapec. We had a perfect opportunity there to keep our classroom sizes small, and we just not blew it. So that's my opinion about test scores and what I would want to do to try to get our test scoring better. Get our classroom sizes back to where they need to be. Our scores will go up. Okay. Well, Lastly, before I wrap this up, I wanted to thank you guys all for coming on. Um, this is a forum that is actually the new media. Uh, podcast is a new media. Uh, it's kind of what uh, uh, people are doing now as opposed to going on to regular radio stations and what have you and doing um, newspaper ads to get their their word out there as to what they want to do. So firstly, I want to just thank you all for coming, and I appreciate it. Again, I invited everybody. So you guys were kind enough to come on spend your uh, evening with us here and actually your audience. So I would encourage you guys to like, and subscribe, follow our, our guests and what they're, they're, you know, what they're doing and what they feel is, is going to change your, the education system in this area. But what I want to do is I'm going to start with Jen, cause I know you're running out of time there uh, on the phone there with your phone there in the car. And again, I appreciate it. I'm still at 1%. Me. So we're holding strong okay. here. <laughs> so give Give us uh, the elevator spit, uh, elevator pitch what how why people should vote for you um i would like to see a lot of positive change in the district um i do not want to raise taxes although it is inevitable um it will have to be done in increments um i'm doing this for the students the teachers and the taxpayers um, i'm not a politician at all i know nothing about politics but i'm doing this because i feel that i could make a difference and a positive change in our district okay thank you jen Mm -hmm. John, you're up next, buddy. Oh, John, on on un your mic. Your mic. Thanks for the reminder. There you go. Uh, again, um, I think it's something I have to do. Uh, there's a big part of me. I'm going to tell you right out, George, that, that is apprehensive about it. I think I'm getting a getting into a swamp full of alligators. You know, up to my belly button. Um, this can be. I think that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to mop up a lot of things that have happened in the past. I'll do my best to do everything to make it fair for the teachers, the taxpayer, and to try to put us as a school that people want to come benchmark us to see how we've done it. That's my pledge to the community and to the taxpayer and to our students. Um, eliminate conditions in schools, you know, try to get the bullying situation under control, eliminate that, try to make it, a district where people can come forward with their their concerns. I want administration to talk to our staff better, and I want us to listen to our staff better as to how we can make it better for them. There are professionals. We need to listen to them when it comes to what they need to excel, what they what they need from us to excel in class. So that's my spiel for for school board. And I'd like to thank all the listeners who have taken the time 
to tune in to what we have to say. Yeah, that that is very important that we do have uh, an audience that's going to that's going to watch this. Nancy, you're up next. Please give us your elevator pitch as to why they should vote for you. Um, as you can tell by the gray hair, I have a lot of experience behind <laughs> in this community. Um, I'm at the age now that, yeah, my kids have gone through this district and I've seen good and bad and some of the things now that they're out in college, what we need to do and change, it won't help them. But I want to help the uh, students that are coming up. I've taught, uh, I've coached a lot here. I know a lot of the families and things like that. And I just feel that I'm going to, at this point, have a lot more time that I will be able to go in and see what's going on, talk to people, feel what is necessary. And the bottom line is I will do anything and everything for the students first, teachers second, and I will at that point go on and fight for whatever I feel is good. And hopefully we can all get back as a team. And that's what I think. Um, when I grew up here and my kids went through, it was a community type school. We had not only the school there, but you'd walk out in town and the town would be so happy of any of the students. And I want to get back to that where we're a good old community and we really are happy with our school. And I think we can do it. Hopefully you'll vote and I can do it for you. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Clint, what do you got? Um, I running because I felt I needed to run watching what's been going on in the school and our board we can't continue this way and i've got three boys that are school two that are school age they're all going to be coming up through all of our friends and families kids will be going through and all our kids are the future and we can't fail them we need to make sure our school is the best it can be for our kids because they're going to run our businesses be our doctors be our mechanics everything in our community in the future so we need to make sure they're in the best possible position for that and right now i'm not sure we're doing the best job we can and we need to work on that and that's what i want to do all right thank you there clint jen you're up uh, Leah, I'm sorry. I, I, look at, I look at Jen. I said, Leah, Leah, sorry. I just, I hope to bring a fresh start. I hope that this district can start out fresh. I hope that we can provide the best education possible to our students. I hope that we can provide the best supports possible to our teachers. And I hope that our community will em embrace the district and embrace what we're trying to do and embrace the direction we'd like to go in. And this district matters. It matters to me. It matters to so many other people. And we are all a part of it. And I just, I hope for a fresh start. All right. We'll wrap it up here with Mark. Mark, go ahead. Um, I Like John said, I didn't want to run for the school board. I felt like I, need, I needed to. Um, I believe I have a, a unique skill set. And given the position that our school district and community is currently in, I, I feel obligated to put that skill set to work. I've built started, built, and sold several small businesses. I've had successes in spreadsheets and budgets. I've had failures too, and I've learned from them, and I've, I've moved forward and made better decisions as a result of them. I have experience on boards and in the nonprofit sector, including starting a nonprofit that currently runs a teen center in town. Most importantly though, I'm a parent. I have three kids that are coming through this district. I've coached dozens of kids that are coming through this district that I care about. I have nieces and nephews in this district that I care about, and I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about Berwick, the community, the school, and everything, and, and I will not be outworked. Okay. And as we wrap up, uh, Jen, you're still on. Look at that. Uh, <laughs> you made it through the whole podcast. But again, I wanted to thank you guys all for coming on. You guys did not have to do this. This was put together um, by Mark and by John. Here And we want to give everybody a chance to show what you guys can do. This is the new media. This is going to be the new media. And you guys did not back down from any questions. I asked a, a few controversial ones, and you guys answered them. I think that the transparency that you guys have is going to bode well for whoever gets on the school board. Um, I am n n not a person, not a biased person. I don't have any dog in a fight. I'm just kind of here. 
Um, but each one of you guys have are all bringing something to the table. And you guys are all, in my opinion, all very qualified candidates. Um, and I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, for me, it was a pleasure. And I can't thank you guys enough. Ultimately, it's the taxpayers that are going to vote. So if they like and subscribe to the Zapata Brand podcast, they can see you guys individually if they want. And they could kind of figure out themselves who they who they want to vote for. But you guys are all certainly qualified. Unlike me, I'm just a bagel guy, and I would never throw my hat into this thing. You guys are good. I'll I'll just sit back here in the third row and just wait to see what happens. Then I'll jump in every now and then, have you guys on and discuss you know the topics that need to be discussed. But again, thank you guys very much. And again, please go out and vote for, for whoever you feel is the best candidate here. I'm giving you guys as much the options. I did offer to everybody that was running. Um, a couple chose not to not to come on, and that's okay. That's their that's their option. But you guys were there, you answered all the questions, and for that, I appreciate you, and I'm sure the taxpayers appreciate it. Thanks Thank for having us, George. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Zapata Brand Podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast and listen where all podcasts are available. Thank you.